So if I just go right in behind the labia, I've got two ginormous clitorises. <laughs> sitting there. There's, there's these, yeah, there's these pieces to it. I think they're called Cura. I should know this really, but, um, I should know. So, this. so you've got yeah. bulbs, you've got I'm legs. I'm actually afraid of knowing this, but it's go ahead. <laughs> Dear Shandy. Welcome back to Dear Shandy listeners. Andy. Hello. Are you excited? I, I am excited. <laughs> More so than usual. I feel like we're like even selfishly excited today. Like yes. we often have questions from other people, but I feel like you and I also have our own questions today. Uh, just a couple. It's a very exciting guest that we have today. We are joined by a sex therapist mm -hmm. uh, based in Minnesota. She is a clinical psychologist who specializes in human sexuality and gender. She happens to be a Canuck, but I, that's not really relevant, uh, but I deal. just had to mention it. <laughs> we are joined today by none other than Dr. Lauren Fogel Mercy. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. You are a really good sport because I think a lot of times when you appear on a podcast, it's probably mostly about the sex and intimacy questions, which we also do have for you. But we have a confessions series where we just really want to know about your personal experience, uh, having seen what you've seen. Right. We, assume you've, we assume you've seen some things. <laughs> I, I've seen some things, although maybe not as exciting as people might think. Well, uh, so even that will be very interesting to learn. I think you're probably just jaded, but okay. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> so we pretty much have two main sections today with our questions for you. The first is confessions, and the second half will be actual questions. We polled our wonderful listeners, and they submitted some fantastic questions for you. So we're going to keep you busy for the next hour. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> All right. So we're going to start, I feel like, with a question that you've probably been asked many times, but I think it's worth asking. What made you decide to become a sex therapist? You're right. It is a question I get asked quite frequently because <laughs> I think it's just it's a curious kind of uh, a profession. It um, certainly is. You know, I've, I've known since I was a teenager that I wanted to be a psychologist and I think it was in my later teens that I started to think that maybe sex therapy would be the right field for me. And I think that was influenced by um, people like Sue Johansson, who is a uh, Sunday night sex show talk show host in Canada, for those who are familiar, <laughs> um, sort of like the Canadian Dr. Ruth. Um, I was about to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was a similar kind of thing. Um, and, and I just felt that I was so intrigued by what people might be doing, were doing, weren't doing, and that nobody seemed to be talking about. And so I just found that to be so fascinating that I just had so much intrigue and inquiry into what were people doing sexually because we weren't really talking about it. And I seemed to feel more comfortable talking about it than a lot of my friends. And, and then in graduate school, a lot of my colleagues would sort of shy away from asking questions about sex, whereas I would gravitate towards those questions. And so it just seemed like maybe a good fit for me. I have a question based on that. Having pursued it because you're more comfortable talking about it, has there ever been a point where you were like, ooh, like this makes me squirm a bit or like has anything ever kind of given you a bit of a, and you don't necessarily have to specify what it is, but yeah, you, there, something has. Dan Savage, who's a podcast host and, and columnist calls it like when something kind of feels squicky. <laughs> that's, that's his word for it. And, and I like it. So I kind of use that. And, and certainly there are things that can feel kind of squicky to me. Um, and it's really important that I don't let my client know that if it's coming from a client story. And so I think that's part of being a therapist because, I mean, the good news is I don't really have to be into whatever they're into or um, feel, you know, like I want to sign up for what they're doing. I just have to sort of be there to talk through it and, um, you know, help them work towards their goals. But, you know, certainly there are things where I'm like, hmm, you know, that's not really my thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I mean, you've been counseling for years now, but have there been any surprises you've learned about sex or couples or intimacy? Anything that you just, that you can mention that you just didn't really see coming? You know, I don't know if it's that I didn't see it coming, but just I'm I'm kind of amazed on a consistent basis how 
wide of a gap there is between what we've seen in the media and movies and television and then what things are actually like in real life. It's it's just quite a discrepancy. And I'm constantly working with people to reframe and reshape their ideas of what sex is like and what relationships are like, just based on everything they've seen from, you know, TV and movies. It's just really different in real life. And um, unfortunately, so there's a lot, there's just so much there that is not true in what people are there, actually there, doing. You know, it's funny. There's two movies I've seen. I don't have to name them, but there's two movies, comedies, absurd comedies, where instead of like most movies where the sex scene is like, you know, there's this kissing passion and then maybe they get a little naked and beautiful lighting and then they cut to like, you know, it's over. <laughs> Like there's two movies where they show the whole sex scene, like all the sort of embarrassment and awkwardness of the sex. And it's so funny. Yeah, it's, an, it's so in true. Team America and Magruder. M- 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 Magruder. It's a it's a it's a about. spoof on uh, MacGyver. MacGruber. But they, MacGruber. Yes, you, you know <laughs> I, the scene. I'm no, talking. I have not seen it. <laughs> I just know the name. (laughs) I would suggest you watch the movie just for that scene. But it's so funny when, and it's not like, I mean, it was a little over the top, but it's not like it was so hilarious. But it was just like, if you show the whole sex scene in a movie, it would be absurd, awkward, uncomfortable, embarrassing. Like none of it would be good. Especially the first time, like the first sex. Oh, Of course, Yeah. yeah, yeah. It would be just not good. But yeah. the movies make it all just like passion and then over, cut. <laughs> well, I think like the that. greatest disservice that the media does with that, because of course their purpose is for entertainment and for excitement and for you know intrigue and, and for fun. Um, the thing that's really missing out of a lot of those scenes is verbal communication. Mm-hmm. We mm-hmm. really yeah. just don't see that from start to finish. There's no like checking in or like I need to take a break for a minute or I need a sip of water. Or, like I have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> so true. <laughs> but that's those are the things. That's a lot mm-hmm. of it. It's mm-hmm. so true. It's almost like suddenly when people start engaging in anything sexual in a movie or on TV, they're suddenly psychic. Like they just look at each oh, other. Yeah. Right. It's like, you know exactly what I need right just now. just machines. <laughs> yes. machines. Which also leads to, you know, a large part of my job is helping people learn to communicate their needs and to feel more comfortable doing that because they haven't seen it modeled. And so, so many people think that there's something weird about that when really... I mean, in what areas in life do we not have to have some sort of communication with someone we're doing something with? Yeah. Of course. Biggest misconception you encounter, would you say it's about that or would you say, is there anything else? I think, you know, there's there's several. There's many. <laughs> <laughs> that could be a show. Um, but I think some highlights are um, sort of what people expect You know, I see a lot of people who expect that um, the sexual experience will follow a certain linear progression and that it will do that 100% of the time. Totally. And we also know that our bodies don't do anything 100% of the time exactly the way that we have planned. And so it can really trip people up when they experience something that's less than 100% when (laughs) that's completely and utterly normal and it's not realistic to expect everything to be amazing each time with no barriers or issue along the way. So I think that's one of the major ones. And then when it comes to couples work, because I also do relationship therapy, um, I think the biggest misconception is that if you're having conflict, if things are not all sunshine and rainbows, that that's abnormal. That means something's wrong. That means you need to check the relationship or like that's a big deal when you know, conflict and challenges are part of the norm, not the exception. Mm -hmm. It's a good one. Yeah. It comes back down to the expectation versus reality. Mm -hmm. It's so rarely met. Yeah, well, when you go in with completely unrealistic expectations, then of course you're going to be dissatisfied, but yeah, even it's if the you expectations with, that are the usually problem. Usually if you go in with realistic expectations, you're dissatisfied. So it's really, <laughs> it's a tough one. So uh, I, is it okay if I call you Lauren? Yes, please do. So Lauren, would you say you have more male or female clients? Ooh, you know, I... I actually, I'd say it's a pretty healthy mix. I also see people who are trans and non-binary. 
Um, and so I see, I think, a range of genders. Um, and I'd say it's a pretty equal mix, although there tend to be trends in what I see among cisgender men and cisgender women that they come in with sometimes some different complaints. Okay. But you would say in terms of percentages, it's actually pretty evenly spread. I'd say it's pretty even. Yeah. Very interesting. I was not expecting that. For Nor some. Was what I. were you expecting? I guess I was just expecting more women simply because I thought women would be more likely to try to seek to fix something that they felt dissatisfied with. I thought it would be more men. What? Yeah. Oh. Why? Oh, I guess. Well, I just thought, uh, number one, I thought men would be more sort of comfortable with it with I don't know I think you you th- I I think it's about the comfort level which it takes a certain level of um conf- not confidence but it's it's a little brave to go to a sex That's therapist That's what I'm saying and I feel like a woman is more likely to be like I don't know that she would be more in touch with Yeah now that I think about it I think you're probably right <laughs> I was I wrong I actually think no I actually think that both are are true and Um, I think you're right. There is sort of a level of vulnerability that's a little bit maybe different than just going to see a general mental health therapist because of stigmas and because these things aren't talked about as openly as they might need to be. Um, But I think for like cisgender men, if they are experiencing a high level of distress about sexual functioning, and we know that sexual function is packed in with like their sense of masculinity or being a man and and performance anxiety and all of this stuff, that that can sometimes overcome some of the uh, discomfort with going to seek help because it's an area that, you know, I've seen some men who like haven't been to the doctor in many, many years, but the second they start experiencing some sexual challenges, they're more open to getting some Mm -hmm. help for, you know, the reason that it may be a highly motivating issue to solve. So speaking of those issues, (laughs) what would you say are the most common issues? And I'd like you to be really specific, like maybe among men, women, and then couples who might come together. Sure, sure. Yeah. So among women, the top complaint I see is low desire for sex. Um, And so that would be number one. I would say number two is pain with sex, pain with penetration, pain with, um, you know, any sort of insertion. And so that's actually more common than people realize. And that's something that sex therapists also can help with, Um, often in addition to uh, seeking some medical help as well to rule out if there's anything else going on. Um, So I'd say those are the top two. And then probably the third would be difficulty um, having orgasms. We're definitely going to be getting to those because Mm -hmm. that kind of lines up actually with when we did poll our listeners. Yeah, we will be circling back to that. Okay, but continue. So uh, for uh, cisgender men or people with penises, the typical kind of concerns are, I would say, top two would be difficulties either getting or keeping erection or... um, Uh, what we call uh, earlier rapid ejaculation or premature ejaculation and wanting to prolong the time to ejaculation. So I'd say those are probably the top two. Okay. And then for couples, couples. yeah, for couples, the number one complaint is a mismatch in desire levels. So we call it a (laughs) desire discrepancy. So that's unheard of. It's impossible. (laughs) It's never happened. (laughs) Never happens. Totally abnormal. (laughs) It is, it is so, so common Two different people with different, um, you know, experiences and needs and, and mojos, so to speak. And (laughs) and it's not always going to line up. And so how do we navigate that? And unfortunately that can create some really challenging patterns for partners if uh, if it sort of goes haywire over time. It can cause a lot of resentment and, and um, contempt between partners. So it's probably the number one thing I see. And then the second thing I see among um, couples is just general like conflict and um, communication and trying to make improvements in the relationship as a whole. I can see that being the case. Kind of what I would expect. None, yeah, yeah, none of those were like out of left field, no, but no. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I can see why. Especially the mismatched libido. I mean, that's got to be the biggest problem. Yeah. I can, yeah. And we will also circle back to that one. Um, I have one more that I'm pretty sure you can't answer, but we'll just edit out if you say no. Because this, we were, <laughs> we got asked this a lot. People wanted to know what was the funniest or strangest or just weirdest issue you ever had to you were ever faced with? 
I think it's it's not necessarily like a strange issue, but it's just a, a reminder of how my role is often in educating. Um, you know, just, just some of the basic things like, you know, if you put something in your bum, you want it to have a flare at the bottom so it doesn't go up there. <laughs> I've told people that over and over and over again. They never listen to me, ever. <laughs> You know, just sort of the things that, you know, I, I always feel so saddened when, and again, I don't think these are necessarily strange, but just sort of a component of my job is sometimes providing the education that was never provided in the first place. So, you know, having to tell somebody who was in their 60s, you know, what a clitoris is and why they've never had an orgasm is because maybe penetration is not the way that they're going to orgasm and, and just how... Wow lightning that is for them it's sad it's sad when people don't know some of those basics about their bodies Mm -hmm. would you say that reflects poor sex education as a whole i would say so (laughs) okay i don't want to make it in a major way in a major way yeah yeah Yeah. i I think that person believed in the stork for a little too long that's rough yeah clitoris on your and it was on yourself yeah that's rough I mean, it's that's, bad enough for really men. It's actually really common for a lot of um, women or people with vulvas to not know a lot about their anatomy um, or specifically genital anatomy. And that's actually a large part of my job, which is like, I wish it didn't have to be. I mean, to be fair, it is pretty complicated down there for a stranger. And now I'm really, I'm wondering how much I know, but I, I, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm like, mm, I, mean, I shouldn't judge people. It's not- I, I was, I remember that the day that I found out that the urethra and the actual, actual vaginal, vaginal opening were two different holes. It uh-huh. wasn't that long. It wasn't that long ago, sadly. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It wasn't that long ago. That's definitely not That's true. not, like that's not uncommon. Oh no, it wasn't that long ago. Yeah. Really? Yeah. yeah. I, I thought women, it was like a cloaca, like a bird where everything comes out of the same hole. <laughs> well, I, I guess, I guess not, not number two, but you know, the other, the other, the other stuff. Yeah. Anything liquid. <laughs> yeah. Or baby. <laughs> or baby. <laughs> liquid or baby. <laughs> yeah, <that's, laughs> right. Miscellaneous. Liquid or human. <laughs> anyway, all right. I'm embarrassed about that. <laughs> no, it's true. No, that's what these episodes are all about. This yeah. helps to reduce stigma because you won't be the only one who thought that. Oh, I, any guy who denies that is lying. Guarantee you a man listening to this podcast will learn from that just now. Yeah, I'm going to get major props for being so brave to expose <laughs> brave. My, my lack of knowledge. Vulnerable, yes. I'm vulnerable. <laughs> Open and vulnerable. vulnerable. Very, and vulnerable. <laughs> Andy, you seem very excited. Oh, I'm excited. You're excited to talk about the... The Hello Tushy Bidet. Yes, and all the good it does so much for good. one's... So much posterior good for the posterior for the bum. Yes, um, I'm the, really the hole that is not where. <laughs> where? What did you say? Oh, the, I thought I was talking about the cloaca. The cloaca, yes. It's not where the, the the one that you were sure about. <laughs> yeah, actually, if you were a bird or a reptile, which has a cloaca, yes. And for our listeners who don't know what a cloaca is, it's it's the hole where everything comes out of. Yes. And if you didn't know, birds and reptiles and dinosaurs, this is dinosaurs as well had one hole or have one hole and everything comes out of it. But what's interesting is that their poo is liquid, isn't it? Every, well, it has to be. Otherwise, For think it, about it. You block up, I mean, everything. It's got to be a, a highway. Everything's got to be coming out all the time. Oh, think you about it. You can't have something <laughs> stuck in the, in the canal. Think about how they might benefit from a Hello Tushy bidet. <laughs> I was about to say, if you're a bird or a reptile or a dinosaur. Anything with a cloaca. Uh, anything with a cloaca. You would be like over the moon. Yes. But we're not birds and we're not reptiles and we're dinosaurs. However, we do use an incredibly antiquated form of cleaning our butts. Yes. Some might say a Jurassic form. Oh, nice Thank callback. You. Thanks. Wow, artful. Um, and it has to stop. And it stops now. <laughs> it stops with a Hello Tushy bidet, yes. which, by the way, has something that I'm now pretty hung up on because I'm a germaphobe. It has the trademark schmutz shield. <laughs> And the schmutz shield prevents the the uh, dirts, the dirts, <laughs> the things that happen when the unclean, the, you know, the the things go in and come out. Yes, the Hello Tushy bidet is, I think, all the more necessary for a hole that doesn't excrete liquids. 
Well, it's sometimes excretes liquids and all the more reason to have the Hello Tushy Bidet. <laughs> that's, that's when the Hello Tushy Bidet really is the hero. <laughs> To be honest. All right. If you would like the Hello Tushy Bidet in your life, you can go to hellotushy.com slash Shandy to get 10% off plus free shipping. And this is a special offer for our listeners. (laughs) So go to hellotushy.com slash Shandy for 10% off. It's a very, very special offer for the Shandies. Just for the Shandies. Just for the the Shandy bums, the Shandy buttholes. (laughs) HelloTushy.com slash Shandy. Okay, final confessions question, and then we're going to move on to sex. How do people typically react when they find out you're a sex therapist? And then also, if you feel there's any judgment or anything like that. I think the general reaction is one of like intrigue and curiosity and wanting to ask questions and wanting to, um, you know, learn more about like, what do I do? And what's the craziest thing I've ever seen? And what do I talk to people about? And um, it definitely, it's become a little bit easier. I mean, when I was dating, it was the worst because trying to date and also being a sex therapist is is really challenging for some reason with lots of assumptions and misconceptions about me and my job. Um, Since I got married, that's become a little easier. I was going to ask about that. It's probably inappropriate and we could cut this, but I'll ask because I'm a jerk. But have you ever (laughs) had patients or people in general who think because you're a sex therapist, that means you might actually physically show them how to have sex properly? You know, that's not not as common as as you would think. And and I haven't had anybody ask like, well, I have had people ask like, is when I'm describing like a homework exercise or a recommendation, they're like, so do I do that when Uh, you're around? (laughs) And I'm like, no, it's when you're at home by yourself. So um, it's rare these days because I think it's just more. Um, it's more out there. People know more about it and people know okay. more about therapy, but yeah, every once in a while, someone will just clarify like, so am I doing this at home? Yes. Yeah. Could you show me, could you just show me exactly what you're talking about? Because I'm not right. smart. I got to <laughs> give them props for even for having the balls. To, I mean, I guess that's, they is thought it props or is it just they're, they're weird people? <laughs> I don't know. I just think it's kind of, it's almost endearing to be like mm, borderline. <laughs> borderline. Endearing, you know, it's it, it creepy, endearing. One of the two. It's not unheard of. I mean, there was, um, she just passed this uh, year recently. Betty Dodson was um, sort of a pioneer in women's sexuality, and she used to run body sex workshops that were masturbation workshops for women. And they were very much exactly what you would think they are. And so it's not totally out of the realm of possibility. I know that, you know, there were sex therapists in the 70s um, that were doing sort of naked circles and group therapy. And I don't even know all that what they were doing, but there is some history to that. So it's not completely off the radar, but modern day sex therapy doesn't tend to go in that direction. Yeah. But there are, there are, there were or are circumstances where there are women or men who actually do like show you how to have sex. But, yeah, I'm not crazy, exists. right? That happens. Yes, there, it's called sexual surrogacy. Uh-huh. Um, and okay. currently it's only um, legal in California, although I'm sure there are people practicing it beyond yeah, there. California. But in, mm-hmm. uh, in California, what you'll have is a sex therapist who also works in conjunction with a sexual surrogate, and then they'll do different components of the therapy. Hmm. I want to circle back to when you said you were dating and it was difficult. Was it like insecurity on their part or did they just like, I'm just sort of curious to know how that played out. Yeah. I I mean, I think what it brought up was um, intimidation, insecurity, um, sometimes maybe a lack of understanding of, of what that is. Um, And, and I used to try to shy away from like my specialty for a while because I thought it would just sort of be a little easier to get through the initial like, hi, how are you? What do you do kind of thing? So just veer towards I'm a psychologist and then kind of go from there. Um, (laughs) But it was really refreshing, actually, when I met my husband that he asked me point blank first, like off the bat, you know, what do I specialize in? And I was like, well, so, you know, sex relationships. And he was like, cool. And I was like, all right. A keeper. Right. Yeah. yeah. That it's it's interesting actually. Like because I dated a therapist seriously. Uh, actually, she was, was on engaged. the show. Yeah, I was engaged her. to a uh, 
clinical therapist. And, you know, a lot of people ask, like, when you're engaged or you're dating a therapist, are they constantly, like, analyzing you and this that? So do you, are you, <laughs> like, constantly, like, ju- like sort of, like, giving pointers? Like, yeah, you're doing that a little wrong. Like, eh, you probably want to do this. Maybe go at that angle. Yeah, it's not really what you want to be think- doing there. Um, I think the first year that my husband and I lived together, he would say sometimes like, leave statistics out of our arguments. (laughs) Like, like, I don't want to know what percentage of couples do this or that, or what the, you know, Gottman method says about this in their research. Like, just talk to me. (laughs) And so I've, I've scaled back on the statistics. He checked you. Yeah. Yeah. Reasonable. Yeah. It's reasonable. Yeah, it is reasonable. Yeah. yeah. All right, Lauren, we're going to move on now to the most frequently asked questions we got relating to sex and intimacy. Great. And we're going to start really basic. This one came up a lot, and I'm sure you get asked this a lot. How often is normal? Is there such a thing? And then is that number different if the couple has kids? Hmm. Yes, I do get asked this a lot, and <laughs> I was even asked to uh, to chime in on this for um, for an, a news media article, and I, I don't like to give a number because, uh, not to be evasive, but just because there's so much um, variation and diversity in what's quote-unquote normal, and, and I think a lot of it has to do with, like, how does that feel for both of you? Because you could have sex once a year and it's lovely and satisfying and you're good with it and everybody's happy. That's normal. That's healthy. That's just fine. Um, I think, you know, there's been historically recommendations for like, you know, once a week sex. And for some people that really works for others, that's just not going to work for them, not going to work for their lifestyle, not going to work for where they're at. And then in particular, if you're experiencing struggles like difficulty getting aroused or not having orgasms or there's pain, trying to do sort of like prescriptive weekly sex is not going to be so great if you're also kind of aggravating those challenges along the way. So I don't like to give a recommendation because I don't think it's helpful for everybody. I think the the good the 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 minimum amount of sex a couple should have is when the guy puts his head through the drywall at some point during the week because he's so horny. <laughs> Why you're making an assumption that it's the man who wants well, that's it. That's true actually. I well, already read you the questions. You should know that that's not necessarily that's the direction true. we're going in. There you're is right. a funny there is a scene which I'm sure you're familiar with in Annie Hall where <laughs> Which is a split screen, and Woody Allen and Diane Keaton are at, in their therapist's office, and he asks them the same question: "You know, how often are you having sex?" And Woody Allen says, "Almost never, maybe three times a week." And Diane Keaton says, "At the same time, constantly, probably three times a week." And I just said, uh, uh, <laughs> "Always resonated." I know that's sort of you know biased towards women wanting less sex than men, but I think oftentimes in relationships there is that dynamic where one person's like, oh, it's constant, like always sex, always sex. And the other person's like, never. It's never, never mm-hmm. sex. I'm not surprised by your answer to that question. It's kind of what I was expecting. Like it's, it's not, it probably doesn't feel right to give a number of normal because people want makes, a number. And I get yeah, that they do. because <laughs> it feels, it feels maybe like a comfort or like a security blanket. Like, okay, the experts say this frequency, that's what we should aim for so we can be happy and healthy and normal. And, you know, to try to maintain a healthy relationship as a goal is wonderful, except that the way to get there is different for different partnerships. I read once, or I was told once, that the more sex you have, the more you want it. True or false? Hmm. Um, It can be true. It can also be false because it depends on what your experience is with it. So I will have folks who have sex frequently, whatever that frequency is for them, and they're really enjoying it and they're getting a lot out of it and it's highly motivating and it's pleasurable, then that's going to probably keep libido you know, up to that speed. Whereas there are people who do what I call sort of check the box kind of sex Mm -hmm. where they're going through the motions, but not necessarily getting a lot out of it from a connection point of view, from a pleasure point of view. And so, I mean, people can do frequency, like, you know, there's a lot of people who can manufacture frequency, but that doesn't necessarily translate to satisfaction. Yeah. 
I, I find I'm a binge sex guy. Like I you find are. I can go long, so I like a camel. I can he go really long is. stretches, but then if I have sex, I'm like, oh, I want that again. It's now. so true. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Suddenly, well, suddenly you'll be like, oh. I remember. I'm like, oh, this is good stuff. I want to do this again. And then I'm yeah. like, okay, I'm good. <laughs> yeah. You, you, get, you top up and then you're good. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in the old days, like uh, now I'm a little older, but like, you know, it's different when I was 19. It was just like a rabbit. And but now it's just true. like, oh, I'm good. So I guess that makes sense. So the more you have sex that is actually pleasurable and satisfying, the more you're going to be like, oh, this is pretty good. I'm into this. Right. I want to do right. it again. Right. Yeah. I usually say you want quality over quantity. Because just having lots of sex doesn't necessarily tell us much other than frequency. Yeah, I find like I have some friends, very few, um, but a couple who are like have sex like two or three times a day every day. I'm just like, that's that's like to me, that's literally disgusting. And don't say disgusting. No, it's, that could it's, be their normal. It can't be normal. It's an abuse. <laughs> it's an abuse. It's normal. Power. It's normal for them. It's not. I'm sorry. I know you're supposed to say that, but there's well, three well, times my, a day. My philosophy is we don't we don't yuck other people's yum. That's the yeah. that's the saying. <laughs> but I question. I question you the can yum. Question. I you question, can question the yum. I think it's coming from a from a. It's it's an unhealthy. Well, I guess thing. your point is is that if you're having sex that often, how good can it? It be? can't be that good unless you're literally like you have a problem. It's serving a good a problem. Purpose. A good problem. It's serving a purpose, and yeah, and no, you're we just right. May not know what purpose that is. If the rest of the relationship is rock solid and you're having sex three times a day, God bless you. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's I feel like you're more just, you're more impressed and you're pretending to be disgusted, but you're just impressed. I am impressed. <laughs> I'm a little jealous that people can do that. I don't know how that's possible. Okay. So probably the second most asked question. Tips for women on how to orgasm, because it seemed like many, many women are interested they're into it. They want to be able to do it. They try on their own and they're not even sure if they can. So I guess A is, is it possible to not be able to? And B, any tips? So is it possible to not be able to? I, I wouldn't say it's outside the realm of possibility, but it's less likely something that I've seen. What mm. I usually see is that it's, you know, problems with orgasm. And I get this from Lori, uh, Dr. Lori Mintz. She wrote the book, Becoming Clitorate, which I recommend. <laughs> it's a good read. A good um, title. And she talks about how for, for most women or people with vulvas, it's either not the right kind of stimulation or not enough of that stimulation. So sometimes we're, we're cutting it off short when we need a little bit more time, or sometimes we're just not doing the thing that would work for us. Mm-hmm. I say this is a big reason why the toy industry is as big as it is. They happen to serve a really great purpose. They, they help. Four-fifths of the clitoris is internal. So what? Yes. If you've never seen an actual clitoral structure. um, So it's the literal tip of the iceberg. It is the literal tip. I'm going to show this. I'm going to show this on screen. But you all at home. Oh, my God. It looks it looks like like Gumby a little bit. (laughs) I think it's like Gumby had a really bad day. A cross between like Gumby and a wishbone. (laughs) <laughs> yes, it's an exact cross between gummy and weak. Very well And done. a cute Very hook, well like a hook you might buy at like the MoMA store, yeah. like an upside down hook. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's so beautiful. for listeners, start off by going online and looking up like what is the clitoral anatomy? Because you may be shocked because what you see on the outside is just the tip literally of a much greater structure. And so as you can imagine, just sort of rubbing, flicking, This tip may not be enough. It's the same structure and it's uh, it's a homologue to um, to, for the penis like that is the same sort of tissue structure. Um, It gets erect with arousal. It's it's really cool. So most of us don't know what's going on. Where's Andy's that still going. Trying, I'm Andy's trying to figure trying out, to what's figure out where all the where all the tentacles were. Yeah. So here's so here's what's happening. So in between the uh, the bulbs is where the vaginal canal is. So this sits around the vaginal canal, and then this is sort of at the top here. Wait. So so that whole thing is clitoris. Yes. Wait a minute. But are, are those two like the, the Gumby's legs? Yes. Are those behind the labia? What's going on there? Yes. Yes. So this is behind the labia. So if I just go right in behind the labia, I've got two ginormous clitorises. 
sitting there. There's, there's these, yeah, there's these pieces to it. I think they're called Cura. I should know this, really. But um, I should know so, this. So you've got bulbs, you've got I'm legs. I'm actually afraid of knowing this, but it's, go ahead. It's much bigger than most of us realize. And, and so if most of it is beyond the surface, it's internal, it means that... I mean, this is why things like vibrators are so helpful because it's able to give an intensity of sensation that's really hard to sometimes replicate with a hand or a mouth or with penetration. So first step, learn about the clitoris. Okay, wait, yes. let's, let's yes. go back. So many questions. Let's, let's just so many things on. happening. <laughs> let's talk about this because this is mind blowing. Um, is the, the tip has to be the most sensitive part, right? Think of it as the head of the penis. It is the more okay. sensitive part. Yes. Okay. But okay. it's not necessarily what, do, like it alone doesn't necessarily do it for you. Right. Think about with a penis, if you were to just rub the tip consistently, like that mm. may work for you, but that also may not. Yeah. Mm. Wow. Okay. So it's my turn to ask a question now. So then when we talk about orgasming with penetration, is that orgasm also coming from the, from Gumby's legs, or is that so, a separate? <laughs> I'm really like I'm my mind is completely. I feel like blown the Gumby right. Corporation is going to sue us for this. <laughs> <laughs> so um, there is there is um, a disagreement about what the. I mean, we're still learning. So so the truth is, sex research is not the most um, funded research around. And women's sexual health research is certainly less funded than men's sexual health. Uh, of um, course. Probably not surprising. Uh, um, so depressing how unsurprising that is. No, well, and no, so it's, surprising. you know, 2021 and we're still sort of learning some of these things. So there is debate about whether there's a G spot, if that's just part of the internal structure of the clitoris or if it's a completely separate thing, that's still being debated. Wow, Ooh. after it's like a hundred year debate. They can't figure that out. That's well, amazing. we just learned that the clit is gumby. I'm still traumatized. <laughs> and we're like pretty open about yeah, that. It's true. I mean, it's a good point. So we have a relationship podcast and we didn't know that that I am you know so there's an happy. iceberg there. I'm so happy. I mean, I don't think you life. need to have not have a relationship podcast <laughs> and not know that the clitoris looks like gumby. <laughs> What I'm saying is that we maybe should know that more than the average person because we have a relationship podcast. I honestly think there are like 15 people in the world who know that that's what the clitoris <laughs> looks like. This was not taught to me in school. I want to know why yes. is there not some machine that then is shaped kind of like that Gumby structure and just goes in there and vibrates and it's like the whole thing is just it's like, boom. Is that not a thing? Well, some people like, you know, internal stimulation. So by going through the vaginal canal, it might be, you know, affecting uh. and, and stimulating some of the internal parts. Some people like to have the vibration or um, there's also different types of vibrators or sex toys. So uh, let me go back a step. In. So the first thing is go look up the anatomy of a clitoris. It's fascinating and important to know because I think it helps just to sort of give you a lay of the land. So that's step one. Step two is if you've never tried a toy, that is your homework to try a toy. Because for a lot of people, my guess is that by the time you're coming to me or by the time you're bringing this up, you've probably tried with your hand, with a mouth, with intercourse, with a partner, and those things aren't already working for you. A faucet. Mm -hmm. Faucet's number one. <laughs> In my experience with women, women love the bathtub. Faucet. Bathtub and wand. The wand, the Mitsubishi. Or the Mitsubishi. Hitachi. 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 Some Japanese what did you automaker. Call the Mitsubishi. Mitsubishi. <laughs> the same, same thing. Now, now it's called the Vibratex. Vibratex. What? Wow. The Vibratex magic wand. Ooh. Oh. Oh, they bought Fancy. them? Hitachi didn't want to be associated with a sex toy. <laughs> They're I, lost. It makes sense. The, the only thing I think of when I think of Hitachi is that. It was, yeah, but it I was, also the. It was so, marketed as a personal massager. And when it started no, to yeah. go in this direction, they <laughs> wanted to have it somewhere else. <laughs> so that is their text. loss. I think it's great for brand awareness. Uh, it depends what you're looking to sell. I don't think that's what their main product was. But yeah, you could make a case. Wait, for so that. you're telling me that that was released initially as a personal massager oh, with absolutely. no irony? They had no intention. 50 years ago. 
No irony. That was meant to no, be. No, they had no intention of that being a that was meant disturbatory to be a tool. body massager. It turned into the the most enduring and one of the most powerful personal massagers that's used for yeah. sexual activity. I mean, a bathtub was meant for cleaning yourself after a long day, but I don't think that's the way <laughs> women use it anymore. <laughs> so okay. things happen, they evolve. Okay, so t- tips, uh, y- buy a toy. Buy a Definitely toy and then anatomy. Learn anatomy. And then with toys, not all toys are created equal. So I've worked with folks where I met with them maybe once or twice because we just figured out that they needed a different toy. So some toys will provide a really powerful rumble. So the the magic wand will do that. It's it's a more intense rumbly sensation. There are some toys that are more buzzy. There's also toys nowadays that do more of like a suction, um, starts to mirror or mimic the sensation of oral sex for some people. So if you're somebody who needs that and you're using the rumble, it's maybe not adding up for you. So maybe trying a couple of different ones uh, can be really helpful. And I often recommend, you know, start with the, the lower cost ones because these toys can get expensive. So don't make your first one a $200 toy, figure out what works for you and then make an investment from there. Do you get what you pay for when it comes to toys? Not always. You know, there are some toys that are really well made and great, and they're in the thirty and forty dollar price range, and they're just as great as the two hundred dollar one. Okay, so you said in your experience, you've it's very rare to meet a woman who genuinely can't. It's usually that she just hasn't figured out what works for her body. Correct. Right. Right. Let's say a woman just cannot. It just no matter what she tries. Do you have any tips for her to still enjoy a healthy sex life? So one thing I like to recommend, so I I come from an integrated medicine background, meaning that I worked at a a sexual medicine clinic where I worked alongside um, medical providers who also treat sexual health concerns. Um, So I just like people to know this, that there are some people like we have, we have that here. There are some across the country who provide sexual medicine and they may be able to do a little bit of a different pathway into like hormones and your medications and, and trying to figure out more holistically if there's other things that could be going on. And so you might want to look in your area for a sexual medicine provider. See if you can find one that does women's sexual health, because that is a niche within medicine. I had no idea that existed. Mm, interesting. A lot That's of people cool. don't. Yeah, a lot of people don't. Um, outside of that, you know, if, if there's nothing medically kind of getting in the way, if you've tried all these things, it's not happening. You know, one of the other things that can sometimes get in the way is when we get too fixed on the goal, it adds pressure to the experience and then dampens the arousal. So the stress response is what's elevating, not the sexual response. I'm sure the same applies to erectile dysfunction. It's exactly the same. Exactly the same. So elephants. Exactly. Um, Would you say that the, the vast majority of women who cannot orgasm is a mental issue or is it a physical issue? It can be a combination. I've seen it just as much be a mental blockage because they're sort of getting in their head and too fixated on the goal as it is a, you know, not the right sensation, not amount of time with that sensation. So I'd say it's, it's both. Well, I'm not for, let's assume that she's, we're talking about someone who's has a guy who knows exactly what he's doing. Okay. In that situation, if she cannot orgasm, is it, is it usually mental? That's what I would guess. Mm, I'm, I don't know if I would say usually, but it definitely can be a component. And and so I think that's when we get too stuck in our heads. Like you said, like, you know, don't think about the pink elephant or think about the pink elephant. Mm-hmm. Either way, you're thinking of the pink elephant. Mm-hmm. Right. And actually, when you're trying not to, you're thinking about it more because it follows the principle of thought suppression. The more you try to suppress it, of course, the bigger yeah. it gets. So what I recommend in general to help improve your sex life, and this is for both men and women as a whole, they've been doing some research that really shows that mindful practice, uh, specifically like a guided meditation or yoga, these kind of things that really bring you into your body and into the moment, um, you know, mindful breathing, those are things that if you're practicing them in general, 
you're becoming more skilled at the ability to do that, to focus on the present and to just be embodied. And that can really translate to then when you're being sexual. So that's another way to really enhance uh, your sex life or to uh, overcome certain barriers is to just in general practice some of that, you know, grab an Mm -hmm. app and one or two minutes a day start, you know, a meditation or mindful practice. Okay, I'm going to go out of order because it's this is sort of adjacent ish. A lot of people said that they were raised in a sort of sex shaming environment and they really want to shed that and embrace their sexuality and be more sex positive. Would you suggest more or less the same thing or anything, anything different? The thing I, I would add to what we've already talked about is um, immersing yourself in more sex positive content in general, because you've got maybe years of sex negative content or messages or, um, uh, or, or just lack of discussion about it, which can also lead to things like shame. Things that aren't talked about can feel shameful because you feel like you're alone. Um, and so, you know, follow some sex therapists and educators on social media. Maybe read a couple of books about sexuality and add them to your nightstand. It just helps to normalize it, which helps to reduce the shame. Mm-hmm. I, it's, it true. seems obvious, but at the same time, I wouldn't have... I mean, it's, I wouldn't have thought of that, honestly. Sure. But yeah, yeah I think great. I think you two have some homework. You're going to learn about the uh, the clitoris. Hey, what are you saying? <laughs> I know everything. Everything. I think you mean Gumby. <laughs> <laughs> now that was very scary. I'm going to have a lot of nightmares about that clitoris. Are, are you kidding? It was so cool. Yeah, but it's so much more. Like I've been <laughs> sitting there twiddling away at this tiny little nothing. There's like a whole universe below it. I didn't know that. You have a lot scary. of discovery. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's it's a whole new world. A whole new world. You Go should ahead. be excited. I am, but I, I still am not sure what's... I'm a little scared. <laughs> okay, another frequently asked question, and we sort of alluded to this earlier. Uh, many, many straight women brought up their partners not having any sex drive to the point where they basically don't have sex at all or just not with any frequency. In your experience, what does this mean? Any suggestions? Yeah, I would say so if their partners are male, so you said straight couples or straight women, mm-hmm. um, I would say there's sort of top two reasons that I've seen, now that doesn't mean there's only two reasons, but what I've seen in my practice um, is uh, desire in men can sometimes be low secondary to uh, erection problems. And so if if you're you know kind of worried that it's not gonna go the way you'd like, or there might be difficulties, that can kind of create an avoidance of sex and a low desire for sex because it just sort of brings up those challenges So sometimes it's secondary to something else uh, sexually related. So that could be a point of um, curiosity and asking a little bit more about that. Um, Another thing I've seen is that it can certainly be something that's common for folks who are struggling with depression. Uh, Mm -hmm. Low energy, low mood, low, you know, fatigue, things like that. And so sex doesn't seem to be a high priority when you're feeling that way. Um, And so that could also be a conversation and, you know, how, how are they feeling generally? And is this maybe something that we need to look at, you know, treatment or, or further exploration? So speaking of treatment and exploration, do you have tips on how, in this case, the woman would bring it up with the man? Because I imagine it's delicate. So if if you're the partner wanting more sex and you have someone who you're with who is wanting less or not approaching as much, I think one of the most important things is thinking about how you can be a safe person for them to work on this with. Mm -hmm. So making sure that they can say no sometimes and that there's no big, you know, repercussion or drama about that, making sure that you're asking open questions and that you're trying as best you can to not take some of that personally, because I would say nine and a half times out of 10, it's not because of something you're doing. It's because of something else going on. You are raised as a straight female to think that men are always going to want to have sex more than you. They're always going to want to have sex with you. And the reality is, is that's just not always the case. And I think it can be really jarring and 
unfortunately damaging to the woman's self-esteem if she takes it personally, like you say. Yeah, we don't talk enough about higher libido women. Um, no. because, you, because you're right. I mean, if I were to make a grand generalization, I see the higher libido partner tends to be more the male partner than the female partner. But again, that's not always true. And there's, you know, a healthy number of women who have the higher drive or the higher libido than their male partner. And isn't the, isn't it a function of more like guys are just ready to go f- anytime they don't need anything. And like, that's women another need a little myth. Bit more. That's a myth. <laughs> it's a myth. <laughs> I think that's a myth based on my own experience, too. Not not you. No, I, but, I don't think it's a myth with you. I think that applies to you. Wait, what? I'm saying that men are ready. They're just, they don't need much. They're just like, oh, a girl wants to yeah, have sex, I'll have sex. Yeah, but you're basing this on your own experience because some men, it's like, I, I do sometimes, I feel like some men, the stars have to be aligned in a way. Like they need to feel, really? like she's talking about fe- like feeling like they're in a safe place. I think some men, there's a lot, more anxiety around sex than society would lead you to believe. Mm. Do you agree with me? The message we've got is that men, you know, just at the blink of an eye are ready to have sex. And the reality is that that's certainly going to be true for some men. And it's certainly not going to be true for some men. And Mm. I like to draw on something called the dual control model here, which is talked about in the book, uh, Come As You Are by Emily Nagoski, which is also a fabulous book, especially it's written for more of a, a female audience, but really enlightening. And so she basically breaks down this psychological concept that we all have imagine like a gas pedal and a brake pedal to our sexuality. There's certain things that are going to rev on the gas and certain things that are going to hit the brakes. And some people have a more sensitive gas pedal. So that would be the person who's like maybe at the drop of a hat, ready to be sexual. They have a more sensitive gas pedal, meaning, you know, it may not take much stimuli or stimulus to provoke sexual desire and readiness. Some people have a more sensitive uh, brake pedal. So it may not take much, a stressor, you know, something got thrown off during the day, you know, the news, whatever, and that'll just, you know, jam on the brakes. So it just depends. Individually, we all have our own sort of um, system and and getting to know what those variables are. Yeah. Mine, mine is not being violently ill. That's that's my trigger. <laughs> that's your break? Yeah. <laughs> that's your break. <laughs> break pedal. <laughs> okay. That's good, that's um, good to know about yourself. <laughs> nice. Speaking of knowing things about yourself, another frequently asked question tips for one's own low libido first first recommendation is read that book come as you are by emily nagoski it really is a game-changing book for most of the women i work with Um, it's both a book and a workbook and i'd say it's probably one of the most influential books for sex therapy so that would be number one number two would be starting to kind of list out or get a sense of what your gas pedal and brake pedal stuff is so that you can work with that better. Because, you know, we often will focus on the gas pedal, like, you know, let's go to Hawaii or let's get candles and roses and music and like, let's throw some like eroticism at it. But if you got two tons of bricks on your brake pedal, you're not going very far. Mm -hmm. That is fascinating. Mm Mm-hmm. It's just you don't really think about it in those terms. You know, you right. sort of think, oh, uh, you, being in the mood or not being in the mood. and Right. So much more to it. I constantly come back to saying that libido is complicated. I'm writing a book about it because it's complicated. And so Fantastic. it's, it's you know, a myriad of things. And these days, there's just a lot of stuff hitting the brakes. Fair. <laughs> I would imagine right now, oh, especially. Another popular one. What should one do if their kink is incompatible with their partners? Ooh, that's a tough one. <laughs> tough one. I know. It's a tough one. So that is also a normal thing to happen. Again, you're two different people or more than two. Um, and that's going to happen sometimes. So I think, you know, some questions to ask yourself first before maybe trying to negotiate more with your partner is, is to what extent do you feel like you need to explore and experience your kink? 
So is it something that you can fantasize about? Is it something that you can watch erotica around whatever the kink is and, you know, masturbate and feel, you know, satisfied with that? Or is it something that feels like you have to act on it? Because a lot of the things that we fantasize about or find arousing are not necessarily things that we want to act out, or at least some of them may not. So that would be where I would start. And then, you know, if you decide that, you know, I've done those other things and I really want to explore this with someone, then I would really gently start to bring that up with a partner at a time where you're not in the middle of sex or you're not about to have sex, but at a time where maybe you have your clothes on and you're on the couch or at the kitchen table and maybe starting with just a general exploratory question and then easing into that specifically. I love that answer so much Mm because it's really practical like it could you could apply that to just about anything you're basically saying is this a deal breaker for you or not right Right. yeah is it a must-have to act out with your partner in real life or can you explore that through you know fantasizing and imagery and videos and things like that in a way that may still honor the boundaries or the fidelity agreement of the relationship Mm -hmm. I think it's kind of tragic if you have a real strong kink and you're never allowed to, or you're never able to practice it in, in real life. I mean, it, it's tragic life. if, as she says, you realize that be. you do want to yeah. 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 do it. Yeah. Because you're right. I do think some people are like, oh, I like the idea of it, but I actually, I don't, like, I wouldn't want that to happen. Mm-hmm. Right. But a partner who's just sort of reticent, like, or, or unwilling. We always talk about this podcast about how you only live once. It just seems so tragic to live out your whole life and never get to satisfy. Yeah. I think, it, I think I think you might have to add that to the pillars of things to discuss early on is it's religion, politics, and kink. Kink is now added <laughs> in the three pillars. Although things can change over time, which is tough because things can emerge with sexuality. Things can kind of dwindle with sexuality. So, you know, our sexuality changes as much as we do in many ways. Um, Mm -hmm. And even if you're in the situation where there's something that you feel like you really need to explore and you have this monogamous relationship that wouldn't um, be uh, okay with that, you know, it, it just sort of depends on, again, for each individual, like how much of a deal breaker is that for you? Because there's also other areas for, of relationships where that may be true as well. You know, I really want to go skydiving and my partner says that they would just, you know, faint at the idea. And so because of that, I've decided not to go, you know, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. So, it, you know, it's not outside the realm of some of the compromises that we might have to face in a relationship. Oh, that's why I love it so much, because it really it actually gets away from even it being about sex. It really becomes just very practical about I always talk about on this podcast about needs versus wants. Mm -hmm. And if you decide that that is something you need, then. Well, that's the thing. I feel like if a kink is strong enough, you're probably at some point going to seek it out if you really need it. Yeah. Someone else. And and like I said, one life to live and life is long if if you really yeah, are especially unsatisfied. Especially if you have a strong kink that's never satisfied. Well, exactly. That's a long life. <laughs> Seriously. Okay. Two more questions. Thoughts on porn. I feel like you must get asked this all the time. Porn, porn, porn. Do you believe in PIED, so porn-induced erectile dysfunction? Hmm. And do you think that NOFAP, so the anti-masturbation uh, movement, actually helps or is it just a fad? So um, probably not surprising. So I'm a sex positive sex therapist. Um, and, and so I don't subscribe to pathologizing uh, masturbation and I don't subscribe to pathologizing porn. Now, it's a really nuanced area. And so there can certainly be problematic Um, areas around pornography, around porn that's not produced ethically, where there's, you know, coercion or abuses happening. So that's like a whole arena. But in terms of porn that's like ethically produced, where everybody is consenting and getting fair wages and and proper work environment, I absolutely think that that can be and and is a healthy part of most people's sex lives. The, The numbers, and I don't know the current statistics, but the number, both men and women who consume pornography or adult um, erotica is over 50%, I think, for both genders. So, 
don't quote me on the on the female statistic. I know for men it's over 50, but I think it's not that far behind for women. More and more women are consumers of pornography. And there, there's a whole genre of um, feminist pornography, ethically produced pornography. Um, I think I think it's a complicated issue, but I am I am in favor of integrating that into a healthy sex life if both people feel comfortable with it. And it's just a matter of sort of unpacking some of the components of it. Do you think it's possible for someone to consume too much porn and it therefore causing any kind of dysfunction in the bedroom? I mean, I, I've seen it. I, I always hesitate to like make it so directly linked, like because mm-hmm. I don't want to perpetuate the like, you know, porn is bad kind of narrative. Um, but certainly there are um, times where people will um, I call it habituation. We habituate to what we do more and more, right? So if what you're used to is responding to a certain type of stimulation with a certain type of visual cue, that can become what you train your body to respond to. Um, The good news is that we can like undo some of that training as well to some extent, you know, not, not in all ways, but um, you know, if you're used to looking at very specific content or using a very firm grip or, you know, these kind of things, you can also practice doing that differently. Uh, And so it's just a little bit of retraining. Do you think that for a a lot of people, porn sets too high a bar and then you're kind of pursuing this unrealistic sexual fantasy? Yeah, I was going to say, you know, porn, unfortunately, has become sex education for a lot of people because it's that's what they have access to Mm. over accurate information. And so if if that is what you're experiencing in lieu of having some of the, you know, basic sex education, that can be really problematic because if we're just trying to emulate what we see in pornography, it's just the same as I, I always like to take sort of the sex part out of it for a second and imagine that it's like trying to live your life like movie stars do in scripted scenes in mm-hmm. movies and tell like that's not real life. It's no. entertainment. I mean, I remember as a kid, I think I was like 13, 12 or 13, and I literally stole a high, I think the statute of limitations is over now for for theft, but I stole (laughs) high society porn magazine. I mean, this is how Mm -hmm. old I am. I don't even know if they exist anymore, but that's the one I wanted. Mm -hmm. And I remember that was a magazine where I was just looking at pictures. Now kids can literally at the age of like eight, as soon as they can log on, they can see the most hardcore 4K like uh, produced yeah. porn on the, on earth. Like I can't yeah. imagine what that would have done to my sexual prejudices or yeah, I my mean, the, expectations. Especially combined with poor sex education. Of, with no right. sex education. Yeah. Right, right. And you know, I think there's certain things that are like developmental as well, like certain things that we can process at certain ages. And so um, a really great resource is um, a website called Sex Positive Families. And that breaks down a lot of, um, they have a whole book list with content for sex education by the age group. So when you're this age, when you're this age, like what information do you need? And, you know, if you don't want young people finding and accessing that and and learning from that and that being the basis of their sex education, then you have to provide some media literacy, porn literacy, sex education, because if you don't, I mean, that's going to sort of happen whether you are approving of it or not. It's accessible. Mm. And aware of it or not. And I think it also puts an enormous amount of pressure on young, young women to perform like what the guys are seeing. I think it puts porn. enormous pressure on both. I, I mean, genders. on both. Yeah. But I'm just saying for women particularly, I think it's, I, I think women are more vulnerable, I think, at that age when they're, uh, you know, reaching their sexual, whatever you call it. What's the beginning of sexuality? Blossoming. Puberty. <laughs> yeah, it's puberty. No, Good right, job. that thing. Good job, Andy. <laughs> puberty, sorry. But I feel like, it must be just an enormous amount of stress and pressure to just perform the way the guys are seeing it. And of course, for the guys too, they're just in, I think, a more easy position than the women. It's really not providing, you know, a just perspective for anyone because there's so many components of it that are missing. The fact that, you know, it's really normal to use lubrication. It's really normal to 
have performance anxiety. It's really normal to, um, you know, have to switch positions. It's really right, or normal not. To, it's normal to actually not come on a girl's face. Like right. Randy. No, I mean, right. just look at cut. But I'm saying, no, I, I, it's important to talk about it. It's no, like it's literally true. every scene, the no, guy comes right. on the girl's face. And guys right. who are like, if I was 11, 12, 13 years old, I'd be like, oh, the cum we, goes on the face. Uh, right, right. Well, she's a sex therapist. I know it's not you're like right. You're talking you're to right. someone at a church. No, it, no, it's true. It just caught me off guard. But you're Are right. Are you feeling I'm squicky? Awful. I'm feeling squicky. You caught me in a state of squick. Yeah. yeah. But, yeah. I mean, it's. But yeah, that's exactly you know what people will walk away with, and and if you're not seeing you know you what you're not seeing is maybe he doesn't have an orgasm. Maybe they whip out a toy, and that's how she has an orgasm. Like we're not seeing any of that, and so. Right. I think, you know, some people sort of live in this fantasized version of, you know, my kids are just not going to access that stuff and they'll just know the things they need to know. And it's just, you know, we need to provide that information. And unfortunately, we can't rely on, you know, schools to do it or, um, you know, other institutions to do that, that we have to provide some of that at home. It's so it's so interesting. There's like this real like intersection where it like like the porn is going to the roof and yeah. sex edge is going nowhere. It's, yeah, it's a bad yeah. combo. It is a bad yeah. combo. Yeah. So it's entertainment, not education. And if it's produced ethically, enjoy. Mm-hmm. Love that takeaway. Good answer. Okay, one final question, and then we're going to set you free. <laughs> <laughs> Andy loves this question. Do you want to ask it? No, you go. <laughs> and he's the in, oh, suddenly he's all embarrassed about the question. <laughs> Squirting. Is it a myth? It's yes. not a myth. It is. Something. No. Oh, oh, no, no, no. Some people oh, no, 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 no. I, I, I miss. Wait, you, I then let me. Book. Okay. Maybe I should be asking this question. <laughs> let me ask this question. Not is squirting a myth because we all know that squirting is not a myth. Right. But. The question I have, and I know the answer and I know I'm right. I don't care what you say. <laughs> What is the thing that's squirting? Oh, gosh, this is going to test me. You know, I need to pull out a text. Like, even I would need to pull out one of my books to figure this mm. out. I I'm going to tell know. you. I'm going to tell you the answer. <laughs> what do you it's think P. it is? It's P. There is a whole Instagram page called Squirting Isn't P. It's P. <laughs> that it's a, that's fake news. It's P. It's, it's actually, P. my understanding is it's a combination of fluids. 95% P. <laughs> I, I could, you know what? I can email you. I will email you. I would like that email. And and I would ask you this question, just for argument's sake. I, I have been with squirters, and the volume of squirt would suggest that there is an entire separate organ inside a woman that holds somewhere in the vicinity of a liter of some magical fluid that's not pee. And I find that... that- very That's hard not hyperbole at all, a liter. <laughs> <laughs> Every time, at least a liter. And he's the least dramatic person you've no, ever I mean, met. It's, 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 I, you know, wow. it, this is this is sort of one of those things when it starts to come to some of the anatomy and I'm like, oh, I don't talk to people about that enough that I've got it memorized. But um, I do believe it's a combination of fluids. And I okay. don't believe that... I think there is some urinary fluid or something from the urethra, but I don't want to be quoted on that. So we will have to investigate. And that's another homework for everyone to go look it up. <laughs> I love it's a person homework. who can just say, I'm not sure. I like that. Yeah, too. I it's, just don't know. Yeah, I, it's I, one I, of my favorite traits in a person, honestly. Like it. It's good. Instead of, Very rare. You know how annoying it is when you're like, you ask for directions and someone points some way and then you find out that they're wrong. Oh, that's you're the like, worst. what the hell? Just I, say you don't know. Yeah, mm-hmm. It's okay. Mm-hmm. You didn't fail me. You just don't know where you're going. Just say okay. you don't know if the squirt is pee. Where I go to <laughs> is sex educators. They're the ones Excellent. who know. That's no one apparent, no one is willing to answer this question <laughs> except me. I'm the only it's one. Got, it's, got, it's got books about it. Is there, that's an, that's an interesting <laughs> there's, a, book. there's a whole book. I have to find it on my shelf somewhere about, they call, it's called Female Ejaculation, something of, of that nature. So Ooh. You could really write an entire book on female ejaculation. That's impressive. Appar- apparently. I, I do think that's impressive. Yeah. That's a, that's, that person, if you can write a book on female ejaculation, you can write a book on anything. You, <laughs> they should be writing books about other stuff, too. I want to check out that Instagram account. Squirting, Squirting isn't, isn't pee. pee. That's fantastic. 
Lies. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Lauren. Thank you so, so, so much for joining us. That was just utterly delightful. Was great. And enlightening. Yeah. I mean, we could do this for probably... I, 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 there's endless questions, but I know. you have a life. <laughs> I understand. Thank you so much for entertaining us and also... In, <laughs> Um, what's the word? Educating us. Educating, Educating us. I mean, there there was one particular thing that I am. My whole world has changed. Also, humoring us and humoring us. Yes, all the things. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Bye. Hopefully. Bye. Bye. Okay. Ah, oh, God, that never stops feeling good. Oh, that is a good feeling. Even when they're not tight. The best feeling is the is the release of a bad feeling. Yeah. Imagine if you had your hair in a tight ponytail all day. That's how mm, it's or a bra. I always bra. envy women when they take their bra off. I <laughs> yeah. mean, not, that's the first thing I think of. I'm like, oh, I really envy you. <laughs> no, but it's it must feel really great. It does feel really great. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That was awesome. Yeah. She was fantastic. Stuff. I mean, we could go on forever with that. I know. I have so many questions. It was yeah. it was hard to stop, honestly. Eventually, it would just devolve into me making like second grade jokes. Like that would be the <laughs> eighth hour <laughs> after we got through all the I questions. I feel like you were flirting with going there on the squirting topic. I, you know, it. I, I, I take offense to that. I take <laughs> this topic very seriously. And I, for many years, if not decades, have said this is urine. It is. <sighs> there can't be that much stuff coming out of some other thing that's in but there. But it's possible that someone that you've been with who did squirt just happened to pee. It doesn't mean that all women who squirt are I've peeing. been with more than one squirter. And so it's the same thing. It's not different. Maybe they just have both. So I was with both. like two urine squirters and every other squirter doesn't do that. Well, I mean, I do think that when you're in that situation and you really let go and maybe you have to pee, then maybe it just sort of I mean, happens. I'm fine. It's not. It's fine. I, I, don't, yeah. I, I don't take offense to it. Yeah. I'm just saying that I know that's what it is. Maybe there's a little it's like, you know, it's like. It's like you mix 5%, you know, one part, some other lubricant well, thing. Well, she said a combination of fluids. I'm okay with that. Yeah. I accept that. Well, but, I think I think it makes sense that it would be part urine, part well, pee. Right. I I agree, but it's more like like a like a sort of a one of those like um flavored sparkling waters. It's just got a hint of flavor. <laughs> it's not like Kool-Aid. It's like a tiny little bit. Of Wait, is non-urine. Kool-Aid the the beverage that is not a hint of flavor? Cuz to I'm me Kool-Aid, Kool-Aid is pretty Kool-Aid's got a lot of stuff in it. Oh, your flavor? Let's get off the Kool-Aid <laughs> analogy. My point is it's mostly urine. That's all. And I and I will go to my grave thinking that. Uh, well, I'm sure people will chime in and have many. I would love many. to hear all the input <laughs> from women only. <laughs> well, I, Shandy's are going to, I know you guys are going to chime in and either agree with Andy or shut him down hard. I feel like I'm going to get shut down. And it's you frustrating are get because I've gotten shut down on this for my whole life. Very few women have ever been like, you're right, it's urine. Well, I, what bothers me is, I guess, is that it adds a sort of negative connotation as though there's something wrong if it's pee, which I don't think there I is. I don't know. I think what it's difference kinda, does it make, honestly? No. Yeah. I, there's nothing, for me, there's nothing negative about it. It's just a scientific I would, debate. I would actually argue that if it were pee, then it's a really, really good orgasm that you couldn't control Our, and like you oh, even had fantastic. to let you pee. Yeah. yeah the I fact would, that you peed yourself, that's fantastic. Yeah, that's as good an orgasm as you're going to get. That's great. Yeah. It's flattering, <laughs> yes, right? Yes. Anyway. Uh, we, okay, we've covered, moving on. We've, we've covered, covered the score. Yeah. Uh, she was fantastic. What was interesting was all like the main issues, the misconceptions. It's amazing how none of them were really super surprising. Mm-hmm. But I, what, except the education part, just how uneducated, like I feel like that was sort of the takeaway of this episode is yeah. how unbelievably lacking sexual education is. Well, I think more so than ever before as we discussed there's a this 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 you know dichotomy of enormous amounts of porn and like no sex education it's dangerous it is dangerous but i'm glad we went to squirting at the end because it sort of ended things on a lighter note (laughs) because it went to this really serious place at the end i was like no okay so looking back over what we learned today what do you think were like the biggest surprises for you other I mean, than Gumby. Uh, Gum, obviously, Gumby <laughs> takes the cake. Gumby takes I'm, I'm the I'm going to have nightmares about that tonight. Oh, you should be just excited about all the possibilities. 
I mean, it's I think like, you're overwhelmed. It's like start. It's like going doing college all over again. Like it's terrifying. <laughs> My mind. Was I mean, really do you blown. even? Does that even make sense to you? I mean, it just what you know what it does is it makes you realize how little you understand your own body and where things are. I thought the clit was like the tip. That's all. I, I, and you I'm are ignorant. you own you have I own it. one it's in you. <laughs> I own one. Yeah, imagine <laughs> me. Like I don't even know. Like it's God. That's it took it took me many years to just figure out that little iceberg tip. Well, she was fantastic, and I look forward to her book. You think her job? Like, do you think? I, I and I know we couldn't possibly ask her this, but I know you know therapists probably get to this point. Talk therapists. Mm-hmm. Where like, she's like, oh, another erectile dysfunction guy. Like, is she like, kind of like, oh, I got a, I got a, I got a four o'clock erectile dysfunction. I'm so bored of this stuff. I don't know. I feel like if you get into that business in the first place, first of all, I'm sure there's like so many varying shades. Sure. Of course. And I'm sure that the same way a therapist is often into what they do to some extent. I doubt they're like, oh, another depressed person. You know, I think that they want to help people. <laughs> that's very broad, but yeah. <laughs> but you, well, I mean, it's probably are... like erectile dysfunction is probably, it's probably also broad to just sort of like blanket. Maybe, right, maybe there's many shades of erectile dysfunction. I am speaking out of my ass right now, but I feel like there are. I was thinking of some juvenile joke, but I couldn't get there. You couldn't get but there. You're the, exhausted. You're, entire, you're just overloaded. I'm over this. Too today. much. It's too much. I wasn't ready for this. <laughs> but I do. I do wonder if she has a favorite type of thing and a least favorite type of thing. And that's not a question we could ask. But I. Oh, I now no. I think we could have, and I'm regretting not asking it. I, but, but then she's sort of giving away. Like if her patients see it, they're like, "Oh, so you're not into my thing." Um, but I, I would guess <laughs> you're not into my problem. Yeah, yeah, my, <laughs> yeah. my problem this doesn't is about excite me. You. <laughs> okay, you better like my problem. <laughs> but I do think that I would guess her favorite is really wacky kinks. That's got to be right. That would be my favorite. If someone came in with like wacky kink. I mean, but that I, would be hard to deal with. Like I wouldn't, I wouldn't know if I was like I wouldn't know how to handle it. I guess it me. comes down to whether she would be more excited by knowing exactly what to tell someone to do because she's seen it a lot and it's tried and true versus novelty. Well, the thing is like the, the advice she's going to give for someone who has a really big kink. The problem is, is they're either alone and they have the kink. So they're like, what do I do? Like, do I do this? Like, uh, am I, should I feel weird about this? And she has like sort of a framework of how to deal with that. Yeah. And then she has a framework of how to deal with the person in the relationship who's like, my partner doesn't want it. So there's frameworks. So all she, she can basically just sit back and just enjoy how weird the kink is while giving the same advice for a weird kink as a less weird kink. Does that make sense? I want, I mean, I, I'm regretting not asking her this in the confessions portion, but maybe we'll have a follow up. I would love that. Hmm. Especially when her book comes out, because I will definitely want to read about that. It's all about libido. She said, right? Yeah. Yeah. Very exciting. We also have to read the, the, uh, what was the, the, the she comes first. Yeah. Was it? She comes first. The squirting book. (laughs) <laughs> the squirting book there's a book you're so real you're really caught up on the squirting i mean how can you write a book i mean i feel like it's like a, a page there should be a squirting page i don't know if can you really do a book on that that's amazing i'm just so impressed it's hard enough to write a book on something like really complicated and and like expansive so uh can we wrap <laughs> no we're gonna continue to segue into squirting go ahead All right. Thank you guys for your fantastic questions and for tuning in. Yeah. And hopefully you learned something today. Yeah. It was a very deep and penetrating conversation. (laughs) If you already knew about Gumby, let us know. My mind was blown. 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 If you liked what you heard today, you can keep Dear Shandy in business by liking, subscribing, following, commenting, telling your friends, leaving an iTunes review, leaving many stars on iTunes and all the things that you might do to support a podcast that you enjoy. And without further ado, I think that's it. That's it. It's a wrap. Yeah, that's a wrap. We'll see you next time on Dear Shandy. Bye. Dear Shandy.